Hello, HNET subscribers, and welcome to the first episode of H Civil War's interview series on digital humanities, where we will be taking a look at Civil War era digital humanities projects and speaking with the people behind them. My name is Chase McCarter, PhD student in history at the University of New Mexico and resource editor for H Civil War. In this episode, I will be talking with Jen Andrella about her project Mapping the Upper Missouri. Jen is a fifth year PhD candidate in history at Michigan State University. She specializes in the 19th century American West, Native American ethno history, and the Reconstruction era. Her dissertation entitled, When the War Raged On, Montana Territory and the Politics of Authority and National Reconstruction, explores Montana as a case study to examine how territorial expansion in the West was a key objective of post-Civil War Reconstruction as a national project. Jen has served three years as a graduate assistant in the lab for the education and advancement of digital research, where she specialized in content management systems, data visualizations, and developing digital humanities pedagogical approaches. She also served on the faculty advisory board for MSU's Libraries Digital Scholarship Lab, and she is currently pursuing a graduate certificate in digital humanities. Her project, Mapping the Upper Missouri, made possible with the support of the Cultural Heritage Informatics Fellowship at Michigan State, traces the Upper Missouri's rich history from 1801 to 1853 and explores the global fur trade, the history of intertribal and colonial relations, the early history of capitalism in North America, and the evolving state of diplomacy from exchange to territoriality. Here is our conversation. All right. Jen, uh, thanks so much for joining me today to talk about your digital humanities project, Mapping the Upper Missouri. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so um, I guess to start off with, you know, I was reading through your interpretive essay with the project, and in the, in the essay, you're talking, you, you know, mentioned a couple places where you're talking about inspirations for the project, and the foundations for it. Um, so I was wondering if you could just start off by talking about, you know, you know, how you got into digital humanities, you know, what made you want to start a project like Mapping the Upper Missouri, and then kind of what are some of the intellectual foundations for the project? Sure, so I can begin by talking about how uh, this project started as a spinoff from the first chapter of my dissertation. So most of my dissertation focuses on Montana territory during the Reconstruction era. And one of my main arguments is saying that the West and territorial development in the West was a huge feature of Reconstruction as a national project. Um, so the first chapter definitely looks at sort of pre-Montana territory and laying the contextual foundations um, for understanding the landscape of the Northern Plains, um, what the fur trade looked like throughout this area, and how there is a very rich commercial fur trade and large networks of indigenous communities and fur trading companies well established, well established throughout this region. Um, so with the digital project, uh, the origins began as part of this fellowship I took part in for the last year called the Cultural Heritage Informatics Fellowship at Michigan State. And that was through the Department of Anthropology. And uh, it was a great opportunity to build my own digital project from scratch and also work with a wonderful cohort of other graduate students across all different disciplines and we all brought something new to the table. Um, we helped each other with technical problems, shared ideas, and it was just a really rewarding experience. Um, I've been really lucky to be part of such a huge digital humanities community at Michigan State. And I think my interest with that began a few years ago when I was pretty new in the program still. And I was a graduate assistant in our lab for the education and advancement of digital research in the history department. And from there, I worked with both history and anthropology students um, who came in with their classes and they would build their own digital projects and I would give them tutorials on different skill sets and different tools for them to use. 
Um, and it's just been a really rewarding process. Um, so digital humanities has become a major part of my own research and identity as a historian. Um, I definitely one thing that I've learned throughout this entire process is that digital humanities can provide a new perspective on historical research that we might not normally get as historians, especially if we're traditionally trained in the field. And a computational reading of sources can be completely different than the close reading that we project as humans onto um, primary sources. Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's super interesting. And it's, I think, um, I mean, I can only imagine the amount of time you spent building that. So, I mean, it's, I think it's, uh, it, 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 I think the, the page itself reflects, you know, kind of um, the idea that this that this project is like not only just kind of a reflection of your research, but like you as a historian. Um, I was interested specifically, you know, you mentioned in the interpretive essay that, you know, um, Richard White's What is Spatial History? And you also kind of mentioned that um, the manner in which indigenous communities in the upper Missouri and you know all over North America for that matter kind of conceived of geography as this relationship between time and space kind of in a way was the intellectual foundation for this project so I was wondering if you could just right. elaborate a little on that. Yeah so definitely intellectually um, Richard White's article that you mentioned on what is spatial history is one of those foundational pieces in this field, especially for digital projects. Um, another work that has been really inspirational to me is Keith Basso's book, Wisdom Sits in Places. And um, it's from that book that he talks about this relationship between geography and community identity, especially with indigenous communities. Um, and that the relationship between landscape and geography like cannot be separated from one's own identity or community identity and i think that's a really powerful tool that we should use as historians um, because when we talk about the past we often relate it to time specifically and we don't think about place so much or maybe it's secondary um, and with this project, I really wanted to hone in on this relationship between time and space, which is why I want to go with a story map for building the project. And um, for viewers who go to the website, they can travel across time and space using the pins on the story map. And they can learn different things about um, the different geographic sites as pins on the map. Um, and that builds a narrative over time. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit more about story mapping later on, but sure. um, first I, I, I kinda of wanna talk a little bit more about the content that you kinda of mentioned a little bit before. You know, you, you talk about, you put forward kind of two really arguments with this digital humanities project that, you know, um, sites in the upper Missouri, right, go from being these uh, locations of exchange to these uh, areas of high surveillance as you get closer, you know, to the Civil War, right? You know, your project starts roughly 1801, I think you say, and ends right. around 1853, and over that time, there is this transition. And then, you know, second to that, you talk about how during this, um, this transition, indigenous communities responded to this change in a way that allowed them to kind of maintain their presence and influence. And so I was wondering if you could talk about kind of how those arguments and then how that change is kind of uh, depicted in this digital humanities project. Right, so I guess to answer that, um, I'll sort of jump forward a bit and begin with the Civil War and Reconstruction. So since that is the bulk of my research and expertise, one of the things I'm interested in is how during that period we see an unprecedented expansion of federal power. And a lot of this comes under the 
expansion of power through the Civil War. And we see the residual presence of that throughout Reconstruction. Um, however, to understand why that happened in the first place, we need to go back e even further in the early 19th century. And I think westward expansion is a great subject for understanding why that happens. Um, and so on the Upper Missouri River region, um, we see that the Lewis and Clark Expedition arrives there in roughly 1805. And once they're there, they encounter a long established presence of indigenous communities engaged in a prosperous fur trade with British companies like Hudson's Bay. And in order for those fur companies to be successful, they needed intricate knowledge of indigenous language, um, cultural customs, and kinship traditions to facilitate effective trade. And as a result, this also enabled indigenous communities to determine the limits and conduct of that trade. And this is exactly the concept that Kathleen Duval describes as the native ground as opposed to the middle ground. Um, so the fur trade provides its own rules and governance over the relations between fur traders and indigenous communities. And that persists for a really long time, well into the 1840s and 1850s on the Upper Missouri. Um, and that is long after the fur trade collapses in the Great Lakes, which is primarily right after the War of 1812. So we see this prosperity of the fur trade happening on the Northern Plains. And it essentially catches the eye of the US federal government. And there's this growing influence of American fur companies trying to press northward into the Great Plains, the Northern Great Plains, and compete with these British companies. And so there's definitely this international competitive component to the fur trade happening um, in what will become Montana. And the government is invested in what's happening. Uh, it becomes political, and you'll see newspapers talking about American fur companies um, trying to compete with the British, pushing the British back across the 49th parallel. Um, so it becomes this territorial and boundary issue. And that was one of my early interests <clears throat> with researching this period. And um, so, by the time of the 1850s, and we see the decline of the fur trade, um, we also see the rise of a military presence throughout the Northern Plains. Um, this is also kind of in decline because of the Civil War, but there is a slow growing military presence and eventually we'll see the US military buy out old fur trading posts and they become military posts on the Great Plains. So there is this total transition from the fur trade as sites of exchange into sites of federal administration and power. And it becomes a place where there are US Indian agencies um, controlling the power relations and structure that the US government wants to set with Native communities. Um, and so it becomes this really interesting place of contention very quickly. Yeah, and um, I think one of those key kind of like uh, fur trading posts, perhaps, I may have been reading this wrong, mm -hmm. but that you mentioned is Fort Union, I believe. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that pops up um, a number of times kind of throughout like the, the, the pins, I guess, as you're going, as you're jumping around the map. And so I guess that becomes mm -hmm. kind of really one of the key sites in kind of this entire region. It does, yeah. So Fort Union was established in 1828 and um, it was established by the American Fur Company and it was their first and most northwesternmost um, trading post. And it was 2000 miles northwest of St. Louis. And so this was a major feat for the American Fur Company and 
for establishing a U.S. presence on the Northern Plains. And I became really interested in Fort Union mostly because of the artistic depictions of the fort during that period. So I think in the project I used artwork created by George Catlin and I want to say Carl Bodmer. And uh, they're very interesting depictions that definitely give a U.S. centric view of the fort. And these artists who are American artists, like they're seeing the purpose of the fort, not as continuing this, this desire for trade and mutual benefit with native communities, but for disseminating US power and ideas of administration throughout the region. And so even like just through the illustration, the depiction of Fort Union is very central in the landscape. And in some ways, it appears that it's trying to completely reorient the view for the audience that Fort Union is the central feature of this confluence of the Yellowstone and Missouri rivers, and it's completely realigning the landscape. Um, and obviously that's not the case because indigenous communities responded and they wanted to sustain the fur trade. And they did that by any means necessary. So there is this continuity of collaboration, but we can see through those artworks just the beginnings of this transformation um, from sites of exchange into sites of surveillance and power. Yeah, it's, I think that particular example that you highlight really throughout this project is at least for me, it was one of the more fascinating elements because, you know, you talk about in the interpretive essay, again, kind of like this project really talking about a couple of themes, you know, the uh, international fur trade, kind of early American capitalism, settler colonialism, mm -hmm. things like that. And, and Fort Union, in a way, is almost kind of an intersection of all that, in a way. Right? Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think one of my interests in showing those two artworks and how it's trying to realign and showcase the American imagination of what this space would be, um, was putting that in contrast with an earlier map that I talk about um, that was the result of a collaboration between a Blackfoot leader named Akamaki and a Hudson's Bay Company trader named Peter Fiddler. And Together, they established this post called Chesterfield House, and it's in that very first map that's featured in the project. And Chesterfield House was a major accomplishment um, that Okomaki had worked to negotiate and establish in the region, in the region and bring the Hudson's Bay um, presence to the area so that they could facilitate trade. And for the Blackfeet, this was important for detracting trade away from the Assiniboine community, which um, they did not get along with at the time. So it was, it was a very important feat and uh, the establishment of that post produced massive commerce, um, especially in the trade of buffalo robes. Um, and so if you look at the representation of Chesterfield House on that map, it's a very small box icon with a flag sticking out of it. And it's just plainly marked Chesterfield House. And if you put that in juxtaposition with the artworks of George Catlin and Carl Bodmer, um, it's just, it's really fascinating to see how these fur trading posts are supposed to completely reorient the landscape. Um, and that's not how indigenous people viewed it at all, of course. So it's it's cool to compare those two responses through illustrations. So just talking about uh, methodology and sources for this project, uh, you mentioned in the interpretive essay that you chose to go with you know more atypical sources rather mm -hmm. than uh, textual based documents. And you kind of say that you did that in order to give uh, kind of explored the project like a unique experience of this kind of region and you know I was wondering if you could talk just a little more about kind of like 
the the rationale behind you know going with Catlin art and all the maps and all that kind of stuff? Sure. So um, I have always been interested in my own research for using maps and different forms of illustrations, um, artworks in my research for showing a different perspective of history. And I think generally when we think of historical primary sources, we tend to think of documentary sources being the types of documents you would find in archives and less attention is paid to art and cartography um, and other types of illustrations. And I feel that traditional documents tend to be more reflective of Eurocentric perspectives. Um, whereas for a greater inclusion of indigenous perspectives, we need to look towards artworks and um, oral histories and uh, other atypical forms of historical sources to garner that perspective and um, yeah, really hone in on these different voices that might come in a variety of ways. And that doesn't always mean that they will be textual sources. So for me in, in this project, using a variety of source material, I'm hoping for viewers to um, just gain a different and new perspective on how we can understand the way that history is told and how we can create narratives from the past. Yeah, totally. And I think kind of going back to kind of like our, our earlier discussion about kind of like the the idea of the relationship between time and space as being kind of like the, the foundation for this project. I, th I think not only with the maps, but particularly with the pieces of art, you kind of get that as you're kind of, you know, right. thumbing through each point. So yeah, um, it, it's, you know, in terms of the project itself, uh, you know, you mentioned this earlier, but kind of what is the method behind kind of actually, you know, constructing those maps in the site, putting the artwork there, you know, crafting the narrative. I know you mentioned story mapping, but also in your interpretive, uh, in your interpretive essay, you mentioned um, this technique called georectification. Could you kind of explain what those are and then kind of how you use those to kind of form the project? Sure. So um, at the very heart of the project is the story map, which is the process of building an interactive historical tour of key locations, which can be marked by pins or polygons, um, that enable the audience to traverse both space and time. And I think, like you said, in how I used artworks and depictions of landscape, it made sense for me to go with a story map so that I could illustrate quite literally that there is this relationship between narrative and geography. Um, so story mapping is different than a traditional data map, which some people may have heard of. Um, and a data map can also feature pins or you may have also seen data maps that have different gradations of colored shading, which is called a choropleth map. And that is designed to represent a more conclusive picture of statistical data. So I wasn't using so much statistical data in my project. And so it didn't really make sense to use a data map. And that's why I went with a story map instead and to build a larger narrative and a general overall picture of this history of the Northern Plains and the Upper Missouri River region. Um, so yeah, and with georectification, um, that is the process of overlaying a human produced map onto some kind of web mapping service, which could be like Mapbox or OpenStreetMaps or Google, Google Maps. Um, I used a tool called MapWarper and the website is just mapwarper.net and it's extremely easy to use. It's very self-explanatory and you know, anyone could figure it out. And that's 
where you can upload a high resolution image of a map that's saved to your computer. And then you take that map and you place pins onto the like web or digital map of matching locations. And once you have, it says at least three pins, but honestly, the more pins, the better. Um, once you have all your pins in place, you can click a button that says warp and uh, then it stitches those two images together. So your historical map will then appear on the um, web mapping service. So from there, you can export it as an image or you can export it as, um, as tiles that you can put into other digital maps. Um, there's a lot of code that went into this project. Um, so it gets kind of techni technical there, but um, to just get an image of the map and stitched onto the web mapping service, it's, it's very um, easy to do. Yeah, I was wondering, I was wondering about kind of like what the, you know, technical side of, you know, making a project like this. And uh, for someone like me, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not the most like technology sound person out there, you know, I can get the, I can get the, I can do the basics. But let's, you know, let's say that, you know, someone like myself wanted to start their own digital humanities project. I mean, what would you recommend kind of just, you know, basic pointers for people who are looking to get involved with creating projects like this? Sure. So I would say for anyone looking to start a digital humanities project um, is to look at other examples that are out there. Um, there are so many digital humanities projects and really wonderful scholarship that's being done in history and in all other disciplines. Um, and from there, you can figure out what types of skills and tools that you may need to learn. Um, and I think depending on what one's research is, that will sort of dictate what types of tools or what kind of direction in digital humanities you want to go in. Um, so if you are working with more text-based sources, you might be interested in using something like computational text analysis um, to run a computational read of text sources. And it's really fascinating to do that. There's a, um, there's a great tool out there called Voyant and it's also very easy to use. It's a great beginner level tool for anyone interested in text analysis. Um, you upload your text document into Voyant and it's, it's an online website. Um, and it will do a computational read of the text and it produces all kinds of visualizations for you from a word cloud to frequency charts. And it's great for looking at word frequencies and um, what a computer might be able to tell you about the text rather than what you as a researcher would be able to find out by doing a very close reading of the text. So, um, a text analysis would be great for anyone using text-based documents. Um, there's all sorts of other beginner level tools to create basic data visualizations of research. Um, it's especially great if you're using a lot of quantified data and statistical charts and such. Um, let's see. For mapping, um, there are other platforms out there that are beginner level to get started with story maps. Um, one is story map JS and that's produced through a developer called night lab and night lab, which is spelled with a K. Um, they have a whole suite of tools and not just for mapping, but for other forms of data and other visualizations. That's fantastic. And I highly recommend it. Awesome. Thanks. Those sound like some great resources. Um, and let me ask you just kind of one last question before we move into like, you know, a short demo to show uh, people the website. Um, you know, we were talking about, you know, COVID-19 and all that kind of stuff and how it's affecting us and in our particular areas before we started recording. 
but I want to ask you, you know, in, in this particular moment, right, uh, you know, historians kind of just, you know, in, as instructors and researchers from the collegiate level all the way down to, you know, your, you know, your middle school history class, right, we're being forced to kind of rethink how we not only access, you know, materials, but then how we turn around and present that to students or, you know, um, an audience, right? And so I was just kind of wondering what your thoughts were on digital humanities kind of in this moment and kind of what their role is, what new role they're possibly taking on and, you know, how they can help historians better, you know, do their job, basically. Sure, yeah, that, that is such an important question, um, especially now. And I think there has never been a more critical moment for digital humanities. And when I've worked with students for the last few years and building their own digital projects, and I see a lot of apprehension and nervousness among students who we think that because they're young, they're technically um, savvy. And that is not always the case. And we certainly cannot assume that. Um, but I also hope to teach them that digital humanities is not something to be afraid of and that we need to fully embrace the digital world and that it can open all sorts of possibilities for us as teachers and as researchers. Um, and for educators, especially, I think that throughout this entire pandemic, we've seen a growing resource and knowledge base out there for different online tools, um, different pedagogical methods of how we can navigate this transformation um, into a digital realm. And I think by using different digital tools and digital skill sets, um, having students create digital projects, it's teaching them to embrace this change and also to embrace um, digital humanities and how it can inform new perspectives in their work and how they approach history or any other humanities subject. Um, and you know, I hope that with my project mapping the upper Missouri, I hope that it can be used in classrooms and for students and teachers to uh, have this fully immersive experience a historical experience in the Northern Plains and to engage with all kinds of different sources um, and understanding how this history begins in one spot and ends up in a very different spot by the 1850s. Alrighty, so Jen is going to take us through mapping the upper Missouri and uh, take us through the interactive map and show us some of the features there. All right, so uh, this is the landing page of the website and there are four tabs at the top. There's the map the interpretive essay, bibliography and resources, and then a page for about the author. Um, the heart of the project is in the map, so we will go there. So this is the story map of the project that we've been talking about. And the story map um, is broken up into two halves of the page. On the left, there is a column that can be scrolled through and we can read about the narrative that way. Or alternatively, viewers could click on different pins on the map and it would zoom into that pin and also change the panel over here to that specific part of the narrative. So it's kind of cool that there's the freedom to do either or of those options. Um, I will scroll through the left panel. And for almost every panel, not every single one, um, but most of them, they will also have this backdrop of a different historical map. And so this is the georectification um, process that I had talked about before. Um, this is a historical map 
um, that was produced around the time of the Lewis and Clark expedition and produced with the knowledge that came from the expedition um, of the Louisiana Purchase. And I highlighted this blue portion of the map, which marks the Louisiana Purchase. Um, so you can see that in the process of georectification, <clears throat> it's attempting to line up the historical map with the edges of the actual web-based map, which is this side over here that you can see. Um, it's kind of transparent, so you can see the edges as well. On this side here is actual California, and this is the map-drawn portion of California. It's a little off, but it was 1805, so we'll give them a little bit of credit. Um, so with georectification, you can also see that um, well, I use that tool called Map Warper, and there's a very literal warping of the map that is going on here. And that is to attempt to line up the map um, as accurately as possible with the um, web mapping service. So it doesn't get it right every time, but um, as I said before, the more pins that you can place between the historical map and the um, base layer map, it will attempt to be more accurate but it definitely takes a few tries to get that right. So this um, landing page here for the story map and with the paint over here with information, um, it begins with the context of the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, the second panel, we'll scroll down here. The second panel zooms in to um, Chesterfield House and it brings up another new map here. This is the one that was created out of the collaboration between Akamaki and Peter Fiddler. Um, and you can see here is the representation of Chesterfield House. This is the Hudson's Bay Company post that Akamaki had negotiated for in Blackfoot territory. And here's a zoomed in photo as well. So the next panel moves over to the Great Lakes to discuss the foundations of the fur trade. Um, this is what most people will probably be familiar with. And um, I'm sure we've all heard of Richard White's term of the middle ground. And so I want to give this context of the Great Lakes fur trade before shifting our view over to uh, the upper Missouri River region and the sort of waning part of the um, global fur trade happening on the Northern Plains. The fourth panel shifts out west to St. Louis. Um, St. Louis was a really important port city um, between the east and the west. It's on the banks of the Mississippi River and it's also where um, travelers were able to catch a steamboat um, on the Missouri River and travel all the way up to Fort Union, um, which I believe should be the next two panels. Um, we have the first illustration depicting Fort Union. Um, this is the one by George Catlin, and we can see Fort Union off in the distance. Um, but as I had mentioned before and how these artworks were supposed to be designed for American audiences and showcase how the fort is transforming the landscape. Um, I say that with many, many air quotes. Uh, we see native peoples and communities surrounding the fort and it gives this perspective that um, the fort is transforming the landscape. Again, that is designed for American audiences. <laughs> uh, the sixth panel is another depiction of Fort Union. This one is by Carl Bodmer. Um, it gives another very similar perspective of how Fort Union was supposed to reorient the landscape. And we see uh, groupings of Native peoples going to and from the fort here. So we'll move on. Um, the seventh panel is a sort of turning point in the entire story map, which explains the transition of the fur trade from sites of exchange into sites of surveillance. So in order to 
understand why this transition happened, we can look at the structure of fur companies and the significance of intermarriage between fur traders and native women. So this couple specifically um, is Alexander Culbertson and a black foot woman named Natoist Saxena. And they are the subjects of the next few panels which trace their involvement with two important treaties and transcontinental in the Transcontinental Railroad Survey. Um, Natoist Saxena was one of the most important diplomatic figures on the Upper Missouri, and I used an artistic analysis to discuss how Native women um, were significant cultural brokers in the fur trade, and they were also business intermediaries and interpreters. They hosted people in their homes, and this was all very significant to the growth of the fur trade. Um, gradually, this story map covers people, locations, and events spanning 50 years of history. And although this map begins in 1801, um, it ends up in 1853. Um, let me go through these couple of trees here. Let's see. Yeah, so the map ends up in roughly 1853. Um, and it features another map. This one was created by an Assiniboine individual um, who's anonymous, but it demonstrates another illustration of the Upper Missouri River. Um, it appears very similar to a Kamakis map, which we had began with. Um, that one was from 1801. And we see the Upper Missouri with its several different tributaries coming off of it. And um, I think even though this map is 52 years after that 1801 map, it powerfully illustrates the continuity of indigenous perceptions of space. And this map, as we can see, it does not acknowledge um, colonial representations of boundaries in space that were supposedly imposed upon the Missouri at this time. And despite the efforts of colonial powers to reimagine, redraw, and visualize a space of their own, we also see an important indigenous response and continuity of how um, they visualize their own spaces. So that is the very last pane. And um, there's a return home button that will take us to the, um, back to the landing page of the overall website. And from here, I encourage viewers to check out the interpretive essay and there's also a bibliography and resources which I hope can also be really useful especially for teachers who are interested in um, talking about Northern Plains history and history of the fur trade on the Upper Missouri. Um, there's a list of secondary sources, a couple of primary sources that were used in the project and there is a list of digital primary sources and collections that I found really useful um, in developing this project. All right, Jim, well, thank you so much for uh, talking about mapping the Upper Missouri with us and being our first guest on HNET Civil War's uh, Digital Humanities interview series. It was a really great conversation. Um, if you're interested in, you know, exploring uh, Jim's project more, you can find it at www.mappingtheuppermissouri.com. You can also find it through uh, the HNET Civil War page under the resource tab and through the digital humanities link. And also, um, Jen, if you have uh, like a professional Twitter or a web page where people can find you and see what you're up to and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, people can find me on Twitter at Jen underscore Andrella. Um, I also have a personal website, jenniferandrella.com, um, or you can find me through Michigan State's History Department's website. I have a page on there. And um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Um, my MSU email is andrella at msu.edu. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for watching. Thank you.